Please join me in welcoming the Honorable <laughs> Albert Gore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very warm welcome. And Jim McCarthy, thank you for your leadership of this wonderful organization and for your longtime friendship to me. Jim has been one of my mentors for many years now. And uh, there were more than a few of the slides in my slideshow that literally came uh, with commentary that I repeated virtually word for word from what Jim uh, patiently explained to me. Rosina Bierbaum, who's also here, uh, is another of your colleagues who is among that group that has been mentoring me for a long time and helping, showing extraordinary patience again and helping me to understand uh, difficult subjects that, uh, and then try to translate them into language that, that I can understand and that I can use to communicate. And I'm uh, more grateful than I can possibly express in words. I want to thank uh, the very distinguished chairman of your board, David Baltimore. Uh, very grateful uh, for the entire board and for the leadership of this organization. As I was listening, uh, Oh, by the way, I want to acknowledge all of the people in the overflow room. Thank you very much for, for being there and for, for listening. Um, it's great to be back in Chicago. I just, uh, I love this city. And when you were, you know, I'm a recovering politician. I'm on, <laughs> I'm on about step nine. But uh, whenever you brought up the election, I immediately thought 73%. That's what Chicago did. And I... <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I'm not here to talk about politics, that, that, uh, except in the broadest sense. Uh, that's, that seems so long in the past. I was reminded of how long ago that was when recently I was uh, with a friend in a restaurant in Los Angeles, where I was this morning. This happened some time back. But uh, we were on the way to the airport and stopped at a soup and sandwich restaurant and sat down on plastic chairs at a plastic table and I was eating my soup and this woman came walking in front of the table just staring at me as she walked past. And I didn't think much about it until a few moments later I noticed out of the corner of my eye here came the same woman from the opposite direction <laughs> just staring at me. And so, to be polite, I looked up and I said, how do you do? And she stopped and took two steps forward and she said, you know, if you dyed your hair black, <laughs> you would look just like Al Gore. <laughs> I said, well, th thank you. She said, you sound like him too. <laughs> To all of you, thank you for the invitation to come and speak to such a distinguished gathering. Uh, I uh, am very conscious of the fact that we are meeting on the very day that uh, President Barack Obama uh, is uh, asking the Congress to pass his stimulus program, which has a very large and robust green stimulus component, and uh, if you have been following the news, you will know that uh, this afternoon the House of Representatives passed it and the Senate is voting at, right now, and they're holding the vote open for one senator who was uh, attending a memorial service for his mother, and by the end of uh, the, the evening, uh, we should know the results, and it, it looks good right now. The economic crisis and the climate crisis are, in fact, intertwined in more than one way. Our nation faces three crises simultaneously. The economic crisis has two parts, the credit crisis and the global synchronized recession. 
both unusual. Credit crises are not that unusual, but the, the breadth and depth of this recession is quite unusual. The second crisis is a national security crisis, and without in any way uh, trying to uh, open, reopen the long, difficult debate over the war in Iraq, I, I really don't want to open. I happen to believe it was a mistake, but my point in mentioning it is that whether you were for it or against it, I think we could all agree that among the reasons we went to war in Iraq, at least one of those reasons was connected to the fact that our nation has a, a very heavy dependence on oil and the largest recoverable reserves by far are in the Persian Gulf and twice in a little more, more than a decade we have been drawn into military conflicts there. And then the third crisis is the one I'm going to talk about today, the, the climate crisis. But just a word about the first two. The credit crisis was detonated, if you will. Some explosions require an initial detonation and then a larger one to follow. And the detonator of this one was the subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, and to recap, uh, when Tipper and I got our first mortgage, we had to show proof uh, that we could pay the mortgage and make a down payment. And I. Sort of thought that was the way it still was, but I was among many who found out to my surprise that the rules had changed and the uh, evident risk without having a down payment or proof of an ability to pay the regular payments, that risk was uh, seen to be washed out by securitizing these subprime mortgages and selling them into the global market. We've all heard the saying that there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Perhaps uh, on that list of top 10 most powerful things, you would also put uh, the destructive power of an assumption whose time has suddenly passed. And the assumption that there was no risk in these subprime mortgages suddenly collapsed and the crisis of confidence in the credit market spread rapidly. We now have $7 trillion worth of subprime carbon assets whose value is based on the assumption that it's perfectly all right to put 70 million tons of global warming pollution into the thin shell of atmosphere surrounding our planet. And that assumption is in the process of collapsing. We are now making uh, the beginnings of a shift away from carbon-based fuels. And of course, the urgent question is how quickly we can make that shift, how quickly we can stop deforestation uh, and introduce much higher levels of efficiency and conservation, the easiest ways to reduce global warming pollution, and shift to uh, renewable sources of energy. But the second part of the economic crisis is the synchronized global recession. And typically a recession is uh, combated by the economic policy makers with a combination of monetary policy, including the tools available to the Federal Reserve, and fiscal policy or budget policy. And since interest rates are nearly zero, the tools in the monetary toolbox are not particularly useful. And the burden falls upon fiscal policy, and that's why we've had all the focus on a stimulus to try to uh, restore uh, economic uh, robustness. And we need a global synchronized stimulus. And of course, the United States is the only nation that can truly lead the world in a matter of this kind. And uh, forgive me if that sounds uh, uh, chauvinistic uh, as, as an American. Let me turn off my iPhone. <laughs> if you all haven't switched to iPhones yet, you should. <laughs> um, sorry to throw a commercial in there, isn't it? Uh, you know? um, didn't mean to, but... <laughs> 